Good morning, and uh, with all systems set, we should now be live. It's 8 o'clock here in Chicago on a sunny Friday um, that we would have had our annual conference, but um, sadly this year with all the events around COVID-19, uh, it's not happening. So um, I took this opportunity to try um, live streaming for once. I've used this to tape a couple of short videos, both for my students and some placed on YouTube. So now let's see if we can do the hour long format um, that this workshop um, has had uh, in the same vein. Um, sadly, of course, I see no feedback from the audience whatsoever, but I, uh, I assume you can see and hear me fine as well as the screen. I have slides prepared. Um, they are at the uh, usual page uh, where my PDF slides from talks uh, sit, so you can, um, you can go there now if you Google edible slides um, or presentations should should come up. Uh, I think there's also, uh, there may not be a link from the, from the blog post, but it will be up shortly thereafter. And of course, you can, of course, simply follow along the uh, streaming. That's what we're set up for. Um, so what we're trying to do in just an hour is a little bit of motivation of why you would want to use RCPP, and I even added a little bit of why you would not want to use RCPP. I mean, it's absolutely um, not compulsory or a requirement. Uh, everybody has, has choices, so I'll, I'll get to that really briefly at the end too, and then mostly have some gentle introduction about the how without getting too complicated. It is, of course, a relatively way topic. Uh, we have a number of vignettes, uh, nine or by now even ten with the next release uh, that come with the package. There's a lot that one can read and a lot of detail, which one in some cases has to bite in. But what I'm trying to show in the tutorial is that for the really simple cases, it's really not that difficult um, and it can offer a lot of upside. And that's uh, that's basically how we're doing it. So the, the main motivation really for why RCPP is unapologetic speed and performance um, r is a fantastic language for modeling working with data slicing analyzing summarizing subsetting data but there are a couple of things that r does not so well function calling is one uh, loops in the interpreter is not so great both things are really easy to do with the compiled uh, language such as uh, c++ so um, that makes it really really easy Historically, some of the earliest adopters of RCPP were people doing just that, lots of loops, um, a lot of MCMC -MC runs, a lot of bootstrapping simulated things. Um, of course, RCPP also allows us to do things that we couldn't do before, not only because of speed. Um, it uh, you know, opens the door to other libraries and tools, um, and it's pretty easy to extend uh, R that, that way. I. Um, I uh, think uh, many of you may be familiar with the two older dictums from John Chambers out of his series of books about S and R that everything in R is an object and everything that happens is a function call. In his most recent book, Extending R, he put a third point on that, that interfaces from R to other languages are a natural part of the system. And that's really how one should see it. Um, you don't have to force yourself to stick with a single language. If you can go to others, and his book details how to do Python <coughs> or Julia or C++. So he will do a little bit of C++. And just to take a little bit sort of of the fear and the complexity away, I revised that a little and didn't immediately jump into a speed example, but just uh, an example of how simple a function in C++ can be. Here is a um, pretty simple, almost trivial um, function in R that tests whether a supplied um, number is actually even or odd. Um, we're showing a few things in the function here. We're having a default argument. Uh, we're being explicit and passing an integer. The actual computation then is taking the supplied number. And uh, I think this would uh, vectorize naturally as well, divided by two and uh, <coughs> divided with the remainder operator and seeing that the remainder is one. If we have divided by two and have a remainder of one, we have an uneven number, an odd number. So, you know, five divided by two leaves the remainder of one. So this evaluates to true. I just now notice after having used this for a while, this is unusual. I usually use error assign rather than equal. And then we return the result. And this being in our markdown page. So we're having the function here. We're invoking the function and the result that comes back 
immediately tested is false as we expect. We can write almost the same in C++ even though we may not have seen much C++. A few differences jump out. C++ is a statically typed language. Each variable now has a type assigned, so here we're making it explicit. In comes an integer. Um, out comes a logical value. The result of the operation is a logical value. That logical value will return lines and in a semicolon and a few things are different the uh, the assignment operator here is the same because i use equal on the previous sign the division uh, the remainder from a division is not a percent percent operator but just percent comparison is still equal equal so it's um it's, it's pretty close this of course now is if you wish pseudocode it's just code that i put on a piece of paper or or a slide it doesn't yet run but one thing that made rcpp really appealing um, after this change brought to us by uh, JJ many, many years ago, is what we call RCBP attributes. We have a set of functions, more about those in a few minutes, in the RCPP package that allow you to take an argument supplied as far as R sees it as a constant string and turn it into a little program. So here, our markdown shows this clearly. In the uh, code rendering chosen here that strings are in green from the opening to closing double uh, quotes it's it's a fixed constant vector uh, r is not really doing anything with it it just passes it to an internal function to rcpp and this is the code from the previous page we're just passing this around as is and then rcpp does something reasonably magic with it it passes this code um, finds out what the function identifier is uses that to assign the um, compiled function 2 so we'll now out of this have an r callable function is odd cpp with the same name as the c++ code uh, there's one level of interaction happening behind the scenes the actual c++ function does not have this name but it's called by this function it doesn't really matter to us now all of a sudden we have the same function that we had before in r in c++ um, that's just an existence proof because this is not terribly exciting it just did what we did before at you know roughly the same speed i mean it won't be dramatically faster because the r function isn't doing all that much here and then just again to sum up um you know basic operations aren't really all that different we think in terms of, in, in terms of functions we're writing little functions we're calling functions and within the functions the bodies are pretty much the same so here thanks to rcpp providing a c plus plus function is just about the same complexity in length of text, if you allow that really approximate measure, as the R function. Um, so, yep, it's relatively easy and, you know, have people used it? Yes, they have. Um, we came out with this in this version of RCVP, if you wish, in, in late 2008. There was an earlier version there, so this is in, in a way a, 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 a two as well. Uh, adoption was relatively tepid and slow in those years and I eagerly just you know counted oh my god we have 10 packages using it 20 30 JJ reminded me a couple of years that I was in uh, in Boston speaking to the local R users group there and had the broadest smile on my face because oh my god we had 50 in you know 2013 or whatever that was and um, then this accelerated a little and we had a really steep incline over the last couple of years and we're now uh, coming up to 2000. As of this week, we're at 1955. Um, the, uh, there's a little bit of, you know, jaggedness going in on here, uh, particularly this here. Things changed a little at, at, at CRAN. More packages are being, are being um, removed. What's also an interesting line is that, uh, and that's why I started plotting this together for the first couple of years, is taking the number of packages that use RCP divided by the total number of packages on CRAN. And um, of course, it's you know two different magnitudes uh, displayed, so it's two different units and scaling systems. So the chart uh, squishes them together. And uh, by virtue of that, these lines were actually overlaying uh, for the last couple of years, but something changed a little. So we had a, a relatively um, steep increase um, from you know 14 to 17 or 18 maybe. And maybe it's flattening a little here, um, closer again to, to, to that curve. It's a little, a little hard to tell, but it's still, pretty impressive and we're um we just knocked off 12 percent a couple of months ago we're currently at 12.4 and i watch this number um relatively regularly 
as a sort of proud parent of the of the project because we're about to hit 12.5 and that will mean uh, one out of eight packages uh, on crane using it which is which is really mind-boggling um, so yeah the, the the raw numbers about 1955 as of uh, yesterday and again this morning when I briefly checked and because I do these slides on an annual cycle I can then compare oh what did I have on these slides the year before and so the Delta now year over year is about 313 um, it's about a tenth of that at Bioconductor um, with within uh, uh, pretty uh, large growth uh, last year relative to the total number and then of course it's you know on github and other projects and, and people may use it in other in other places this is also a very flattering very impressive measure that i first saw at use r in aarhus um, andre de vries um, then at revo now at our studio has a package uh, on github not on crayon as I, far as i know that takes crayon and analyzes it, analyzes it with some you know standard matrix math in a way similar to the PageRank algorithm at the at Google, meaning that the incoming connections are, um, are, are weighted. Um, so centralness of packages comes out of Here's this. And, from the web. Um, that was my phone just talking to me because I thought it um, it thought I asked a question, so let's turn that off. Um, and yeah, anyway, I was in the audience when he first saw that, and I think Asavivi was already up out in front. And the um, I, I'm, I I must admit I don't quite understand the the difference in the scaling. These these gaps uh, are pretty wide to ggplot and mass. But again, it's something that I had in the talks for a couple of years. And ggplot, I think when I first did this, it was just behind MASS, and it was slowly creeping up. And of course, ggplot, dplyr, um, Magritta. Uh, widely used over in the tidyverse, uh, now basically on the same order of magnitude as something as Matrix and MASS, which has been a core of R for as long as I've been using R, which is uh, 25 years. A couple of other packages one recognizes um, in the list. We'll talk a little bit of Asambu, Asambu, Amadeo a little later. Um, and that's that. And um, similarly, this is this measure that I mentioned earlier that I'm, uh, that I'm watching a little with the... Um, percentages um, on CRAN, um, something that we never quite knew when we looked at, well, 1955 packages, how does that actually compare to the number of packages using compiled code on CRAN? And um, R340 gave us a new helper function from the tools package, the tools package really being the one that CRAN internally uses tools for working around with packages for the archive. It returns a very large results matrix, the package DB, um, it has as many rows as there are packages and as many columns as there are attributes that we can take out of the description files. I think it's 65 or so. And among them is, um, for example, the field needs compilation, which is just a binary toggle. Um, actually, oddly enough, it has the values yes, no, and no. Uh, many, uh, I think, with a lowercase no and a single misspelled one with an uppercase no, but you know, that's just, that's just how it goes. Uh, if we're calculating a table of yes, that's correct. And what we're getting out of this is the number of packages on CRAN that actually need compilation that have a source directory. Of course, those could be Fortran packages or Rust packages or anything. So we're just going, going really broadly, how many packages do need compilation? So um, yeah, in the tools package also is a function depends on that gives you the re reverse dependencies, either recursive or not. So I'm using that here similarly with the returned uh, uh, database to see the total number of RCPP packages, now 1955. Um, this year I made a revision that I hadn't done earlier and I, I mentioned that briefly on the on the blog. Uh, in this set I actually duplicated packages or right before a new release comes out, triplicated packages. It has something to do with the special status of the recommended packages. Um, I keep forgetting why CRAN has those double, but when a new version of R comes, then they often preload them and put them in early and have a requirement on depends greater than the R version, so they uh, can exist in the database concurrently because uh, they're, con they're constrained away. Anyway, details, details. It just double counts makes the makes the total number uh, a little little larger and I'm now, now correct for that. And then under that, we have RCPP packages divided by total compiled packages, giving us this um, percentage or proportion, which is currently at 50.7, which is um, really pretty awesome. We crossed that uh, two months or so ago, just before 
um, R4O came out. So now it basically means that for every two packages, every two packages on trend that use compiled code, one of them uses RCPP, which is, you know, it's just really, really mind blowing. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a huge uh, statement of, of faith and trust in the stability of the package. So it's, it's really good and keeps us honest and, and working pretty hard at the package. So it is popular, it is widely used. So um, you may be interested in, well, how would I use that? And uh, one of the simplest ways of getting started, and I can show this now actually live because I have our studio sitting here and I am showing the entire desktop. If I just go in new file and say C++ file, then our studio helpfully gives me a quick little file. And I show that here on the slides and on the next slide as well. It has two nice little tricks. Again, features of attributes, something really so thoughtful contributed to RCPP years ago by, um, by JJ when he became a core contributor. We have a text file. It is seen as a C++ file by this IDE and other editors. So it is C++. In C++, we uh, say what resources we want to use, what declarations we need by including a header file. It's a convention carried over from the C language. So here we say we're working with RCVP and then we're doing something with a namespace. Namespace, that's why the name namespace in R is a concept that several programming languages have. Here it just basically means we're, we're opening the RCPP um, namespace that's similar to the import statement in R so that we don't have to prefix um, other uses of RCPP with uh, of RCPP objects with RCPP colon colon all the time. So it's just a convention. So often we see these two together. Um, after a slash slash comes a uh, comment. So this is an illustration. It just shows how one can use this. And here now we have a function. This is now a bit more general than the earlier is odd in our C++ because we're taking in a vector, we're returning a vector, and we're doing a really simple transformation. Here we're saying times two. There's one other trick again in this file that we're showing that if um, uh, you one puts a particularly marked up R comment in here. So C++ comments, are, I told you, are lines uh, after a double slash. Um, C comments by convention always went from slash star all the way to a closing star slash. This was slightly generalized here while remaining a comment for something a regex uh, detector can pick up. So if you start this comment with slash three stars and a capital R, what follows will be taken as R code and um, executed. And in this R code, you can then have a reference to the function you just defined. So now we have, if you wish, a unit test in the source file providing the function. We're defining a function times two and we're calling it by saying times two 42. And using something like that is really, really easy. As the text shows, we can, we can just hit the source button. If I'll do this now, it will though remind me that this file doesn't really yet exist. It's only in the editor and not on the system. So the first thing it'll ask, well, where do you actually want to um, save it? So let's just be um, very non-creative and call it demo C++. So now we have a file demo C++. And because I had already pressed the source button, it then had a file, could source the file and does exactly what I said on the left, times two is now a function has been executed here. And this, is really already quite intoxicating because now you have something that, that already works. You can now mix C++ and R. So if you wanted to be um, uh, a little experimental and see if you could generalize a times two to a times three or you know even implement a times three in different ways, um, you can. Now all we're doing is um, sourcing this file again and we can uh, Um, also invoke the uh, the second function and this time really with a vector now it's going off compiling we're seeing here in the global environment that it really created two R functions that are visible um, they may have a hidden function behind them as I alluded to earlier nothing of, of importance to us really um, but they're there under the identifier used in the actual language and they're callable as in a little example snippet if we're following this convention if i break this and only make it a single comment it's still a you know it's still syntactically valid but now nothing gets executed anymore because i'm simply not following 
the simple convention um, defined and adhered to by this helper function. More about that helper function in just a second. Um, so what happened here? We defined a simple C++ function, and then we um, we actually um, took that definition and altered it and put a second one in. So you're not limited to a single um, single function per file. You can have multiple. Um, we saw that that function operated on a numeric vector. We then used RCPP provided tooling to source it, after which RCPP creates a little bit of wrapper code. Uh, if you operate in verbose mode, you can see what code gets created and most importantly, compiles links and loads this code. We had already facilities for doing that with the inline package in the very beginnings of RCPP. And that already took advantage of the fact that R really is a, is a fantastic and very generous host for us because R wraps all these operations to the operating system. All we are doing as a package is saying R command compile or R command shared library to create a library that can be, um, that can be loaded. Um, um, and it just brings it into the system and how that works is the same on um, uh, all operating systems we're just as a package calling it from that from that level and takes uh, R takes care of the rest and that's that's pretty spiffy and the function as said is available in R under its name or if we have several in there they're available under their name so that's uh, that's really that's really nice with that then back to the speed example and a great running example I've been using for it must be a decade is one that I once found late at night on Stack Overflow someone had code in R to calculate a Fibonacci sequence and was very frustrated because it was also slow. So let's look about that. Uh, let's talk about that and let's look at that uh, in just a sec. The Fibonacci sequence, if you write it out sort of formally in math notation, fancy as we can here with the uh, um, curly brace opening over two lines, returns the argument that it's called with if the argument is less than two. Um, Fibonacci sequences are sometimes defined starting at zero, sometimes at one. I'm using the convention here that they can start at zero. So for zero or one, we're just returning that value. Should the value be uh, two or larger, we define the sequence as the sum of the two preceding elements. It's really straightforward in, uh, in a conceptual notation, and it's equally straightforward in R code. So I've written this a couple of times over the years and I uh, eventually landed on just this two-liner because I think in the beginning I had two if statements, is it zero or is it one, which of course we can express more simply or more easily by just saying less than two. It's implicit here that we're not calling with negative numbers, so there's no, uh, there's no real input test here. But first part of that curly brace from the previous slide, if, less than, if, if the argument is less than two, just return the argument. In all other cases, return the sum of the two preceding arguments. Um, it's a super famous function in math and particularly in computer science. It's overanalyzed to death in computer science. There's a really good Wikipedia page with numerous uh, pointers to, um, to other analysis. The function has a, uh, it is analyzed as much because it has a really bad uh, performance. It's, um, um, it's, it's worse than exponential. It has to do with what it does here because it, uh, it keeps no state. It has no memory. When you're invoking f of, say, 4, you are asked for the sum of 3 and 2. So it goes in um, for 3 and, uh, and then 2, defines those, and in each of those trees, it's unaware of the, of the other ones. So the performance is really atrocious. But Leaving that aside, I'm already jumping to performance. Let's just look at how it runs. If we have a simple function like this and say Fibonacci of the first 11 elements from zero to 10, for zero or one, I just get the element back. Um, for two, I get the sum of the two previous elements back. Zero plus one gives one. Um, next element, um, I get the sum of the two previous one. One plus one is two, one plus two is three, two plus three is five, and so on. And that's the, the, that's the famous sequence. Now, what happens when we use this? And that's what I just alluded to, because um, you know f10 needs to compute the sum of f9 and 8. If it goes into f9, it has to compute f8 again, and and so the uh, it's really super recombining. Um, 
just calling F10 a hundred times only takes about eight milliseconds, so that's not that painful. But only adding five um, numbers to the argument, going from 10 to 15, increases the performance runtime <coughs> more than tenfold, more, more than 11fold, in fact, from eight milliseconds to 91 milliseconds. And doing that again from 15 to 20 is just about the same factor. From 11, we go to 136. So we can run about 100 of these for F20 in a second. Um, really not um, not that quick. Uh, years and years and years ago with slower computers, when I found that question on Stack Overflow, someone had tried, I think, F of 35, and it took half an hour, and he was very dismayed. What's wrong with R? Nothing really, but this calls functions recursively, and because R is set up as a language that can compute on itself, can modify itself, has this whole notion of um, scope and closures and promises and lazy evaluation and all the rest of it, functions have to be a little expensive to provide all that generality, and that little bit of expensiveness gets compounded and compounded and compounded in a recursive function that is Fibonacci. But let's not despair, because as we'd seen earlier with the is odd, doing the same thing in C or C++ is really simple. This is a really sloppy first version because I'm doing this in ints. Ints in, uh, in C and C++ when called from R are 32-bit only. So this one would eventually, for really large numbers, get an overflow. So for real use, you probably want to make that a long, a long int, 64-bit int, which we don't have from R or, or a double. But, you know, just as an approximate first, first solution, it's really the same. We're just saying it has to be typed. We're returning an int. We're taking an int. If it's less than two, we return the number. Otherwise, we return the sum of the two previous numbers. With CPP function that I'd already shown you, it's again very straightforward. We just supplied this as a string. <coughs> um, R goes off for a second, generates the function that we then can call. And we're again calling on the first 11 elements from 0 to 10. And unsurprisingly, we get the same sequence back, which is good. So the result is truthful, and in C++ we produce the same as we um, as we do in R. And this then again on a um, on an example specifically chosen to make uh, the compilation game look good. This is not what you normally get for F20, the one where 100 runs took about a second. It only takes maybe two milliseconds for the same 100 runs in compiled code. So we're having a relative gain of 500 fold, which is not what you get uh, normally, but you know we've seen standard example uses where people have gotten 30, 50, 70, and you can go further. Um, so speed gains can be had relatively easily with RCPP. It's of course not the only way to get speed gains, sometimes better algorithms, better organization of your code are there. There's, there's, there's many ways to get to, um, to smarter code. The best really is to combine both smarter algorithms and uh, faster languages. So um, after the intro of the, you know, why would we do that? How would we do that? Are other people doing it? And a first quick example, uh, just a, a, a tiny bit of terminology and, uh, and, and underlying structure that's in the package. What's happening really is that standard types that R has, an int number or vector, a numeric, i.e. a floating point value, a, a double value, lists, functions, but also things like, um, um, yeah, functions are already pretty good, um, hashes and things. So we can, we can on, compute on many things that the language wants, are internally mapped from R to C++ types. Um, and all that happens with a little bit of magic that is very special to C++ that other languages don't have the same way. Um, it's called, um, template programming or template meta programming. It's head splittingly complicated, but very, very rich in features. The net benefit is that we can just take a function such as this, where a vector goes in and a vector goes out and do something in the function body. Um, this is an extremely silly function that I just put together to have something that invokes some other functions. Um, you know, we can always feed a numeric argument to the log function, but as we know, um, that doesn't really work for negative values. So here we're defining ourselves a log apps, an LA function that calculates the log of, if needed be, the absolute value of a potentially negative number. And we can invoke this. 
uh, with the sequence from minus five to five, incrementing in uh, steps of two. And we then see that, you know, automatically this C++ code behaved as R code because when a vector came in, the vector was automatically um, passed to these functions and they are naturally vectorized. That's not something that you naturally get from C++, as we'll see in a second, but something that we can provide with C++ and its notion of object-oriented programming. Um, how would a conventional C++ programmer um, up to or just before C++11 do that? So um, C++ be, um, has a um, very rich and well-known set of standard functions. Um, it's called the STL, Standard Template Library, and uh, in it um, are a set of um, um, uh, functions for generic programming. Again, in computing terms are overused, so that's not generics in the sense that we use it in uh, S3 or S4. In R, um, it just means that it can provide operations consistently on containers such as vectors. The way this works is, for example, there's a hyper function such as std from the um, in the standard namespace, the transform function from the SDL that works from the beginning to the end of a supplied container here, a vector of doubles, placing the result um, uh, into uh, memory space beginning at x begins. So this is a replacement in place, if you wish. So it will sweep from beginning to end, placing results back into begin. Um, waltzing over this vector the function f that's supplied and in this particular case we had defined f as a quick local temporary function that's inlined here inline is a speed trick that means that the function will actually be expanded by the compiler right here rather than a function call being made but this is now our function f of our dot a from the previous page it takes an incoming value f takes a floating point absolute value they're sort of little tricks in C and C++ that so sometimes you have to be careful that you get tricks in your operations, operations on doubles rather than on ints. Uh, we're saying that we want the f apps, um, floating point apps function from the global namespace, so we're prefixing that in colon colon, same with the log here, small stuff. Um, and what we're having here is basically a C++ equivalent of something like a supply. We're taking a function and waltzing it over a supplied vector. Um, so this is how one could do that. The previous the code on the previous page um, can also be turned into R callable code by using source CPP from the um, attributes package uh, or the attributes component of um, RCPP. And once you have that, um, you can just call the function thus created with the sequence from minus five to five by two, just that we are done in R. Um, The mapping of all these types, like ins, vectors, uh, the vectors, lists, functions of various types, characters in double logical, um, also works for other packages, so one can extend them as well. One of the ones I like working with the most and was one of the first that we wrapped that way is a C++ library called Amadio that gives you C++ classes of functions that make C++ code look a little bit like MATLAB code, um, pretty expressive, easy to read. So the example that I have here will take a vector in, and we're being explicit here, we're saying we actually want a column vector. Amadio has the shortcut col vec for that, just as it has row vec, because now we know that it's a column vector, we know it has one column, and as many um, rows as come in here, so it's n rows times one column. So if we take the n by one and multiply it by the transpose, 1 times n will, in aggregate, have an n by n outer product of the vector uh, matrix. So this will take a vector and by the operation in the function return the vector, uh, return a matrix constructed from that, from that vector. Here transpose is simply a member function for the object a, a vector, we have dot t invoke the transpose and then this operation is well defined and the result of a vector times its transpose is a matrix that we're returning. Quick example shown is if we call it with the vector one to three, we get for a three by one column vector, a three by three um, outer product matrix back. Um, shows another trick again with CPP functions that we hadn't used before. Now I'm saying I'm actually depending on the Amadeo package. So 
the telling R, please look for the headers of RCPP Amadio. It's a um, header only library that makes the deployment and provision pretty, pretty easy. Um, how that is done gets technical uh, real quick, but we have a vignette that talks about that. With something like that, we can then go one step further, which was a big deal for us in 2010, 12, 14, before C++ 11 became more widespread. It's now 2020, time passes, progress, even though it's sometimes painfully slow, eventually comes to us. And by now C++ 11 is, for all C++ code in R, actually the standard. So this line that I'm showing here, I no longer have to do under current systems because we get C++ 11 by default. But plugins is a mechanism with which we can turn on other um, switches. So we could now do the same and turn on CPP 14, which is still an optional feature and not a default, and others, OpenMP and, and what have you. So there's, there's more in the, um, in the RCPP attributes vignette about that. But once it is C++11, the advantage to the previous version now is that I no longer need this one-liner inline F lock of apps. I'm now using something that is uh, called a Lambda function. C++ has that. It had borrowed it from other functional languages. We're basically defining the log of apps function of a vector X on the spot as a, as a Lambda function. And that again is uh, very similar to what S apply and L apply and other R functions do. Just now in transform from begin to end, storing results and begin, we have the function in there immediately. This is how a vectorized function um, uh, would materialize first to a standard C++ programmer because they would take a vector of doubles as a standard vector and then walk through this bit by bit. We didn't have to do that because there's features in RCVP already that give us function, um, give us vectorized functions. But, but this is sort of a, um, a quick little contrast how um, someone trained in C++ before they saw RCVP would think about that. It also in passing stresses the fact that we can operate on C++ vectors, lists, maps, other types, just as we can on uh, the uh, RCVP provided types mapping the R types. Um, so that was a little bit uh, a really quick and casual you know how do we do this um, for that then uh, just a little bit more detail and expanding on that the worker functions that help us in rcpp um, in the rcpp attributes extension are really a set of three the simplest of these is a function that we call eval cpp and it's a c plus plus generalization of the eval function in r It takes the supplied argument, a constant string, wraps enough glue code around it to um, make it a self-contained program, and uh, then evaluates that program. So that works for simple expressions. If you do 2 plus 2, you really do get 4. So I can show that again. So RCPP, eval C++, and if I do, you know, 21 times 2 to get the eternal 42 back. It now goes chaka 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 chaka. You see the stop sign. My computer is working for just a second and I get this back genuinely evaluated. It's not all that useful apart from immediately testing whether your computer is sick or healthy. If something goes wrong with RCPP and a compilation file fails or what have you, you can use something like this to just ensure that R knows where to get the compiler from, R knows where to get the other RCPP components from, and R is capable of doing something really simple. You can also use it, of course, to peek uh, into other events, just how R has a you know system function in there where you can ask it, well, it's actually the max value of a, of a, of a, of a double, of a numeric. Um, C++ has similar things. There's a um, header numeric limits, and that then is templated. So this is its lingo for that we're saying we want from the standard template library, the function numeric limits, uh, templated to a double, and inquire what the max, as opposed to min value is, and then we get uh, 1.79 times 10 to the power of 308 back, which is the same thing as an R, because it's the same, uh, it's the same double. It's 64-bit floating point. Uh, so that's eval CPP mostly just for quick tests. One level uh, more general than eval CPP 
and something that we'd seen on earlier slides in the presentation is CPP function. I'd uh, shown you the depends for RCPP Amadeo. Um, another optional argument is plugins. Here we're turning in the C11 plugin that I showed in source code in, uh, in, in something source with source CPP or in a, um, uh, yeah, in, in, a, in, in a full file um, in just quick expressions that contain a self-contained functions. We don't really have space for the header lines before, so we found this out to plugins argument. Again, here we're turning on C11, which these days um, on, on current R systems is a default anyway, and showing another C++ nicety that had people really excited when it first came uh, now almost a decade ago. Uh, while the language is typed, um, C++ 11 now allows the compiler to infer uh, from things like these assignments what the value is, and here it will know that if I'm assigning 10 to a variable x, the variable x will be an integer. Um, this was also then one of the limitations that it works within the function, but not for the return body. That was a, a, um, a later refinement. Uh, I think C14 brought that, or maybe 17, that this can now also be auto. But it's not um, uh, used all that much. Anyway, small details just showing that C11 um, features were able to be turned on earlier. We can still turn on C++ 14, 17, depending on what your compiler has features optionally. You have to be careful when you do that in a package because not all of your users have that and your package may become less portable, but C++ 11 is now a given. Plugins are, are available. And then the big workhorse that we've also seen, just how CPP function is more powerful and more general than eval CPP and uh, stands above it. So CPP really is is the main one. You can use source CPP to slurp in uh, a text file of 10 or 100 or thousands or tens of thousands of lines. Uh, people have used that for great, uh, great extent. It's quite powerful. It extends and builds upon the CXX function that we had for similar purposes from inline, but is even easier to use and takes away from scaffolding. And you can build some structure around it so that source CPP can make use of a package you provide. So um, we do that a little bit with these three, particularly with RCPP GSL, which is a package that inquires, requires linking, something that uh, makes things a bit more difficult uh, quickly. Um, and because source CPP is so powerful, people um, tend to create um, considerable pieces of work with it and then may eventually run into limits. So we've had this as questions on the mailing list uh, at GitHub or on Stack Overflow, how do I this, that, and the other with source CPP? And the main recommendation that I have for that is don't, don't go too far. Eval CPP, CPP functions, source CPP are really, really good for testing in the small to moderate size. As soon as you have a real unit of work within the R uh, universe, do what you've always done or wanted to do, which is write a package. It's the same with RCPP. While we have these helper functions to make small steps possible, don't stop there. Go further, make a package, and I'll show you now how easy it is to create a package. As um, from the made motivational slides earlier, that really has taken off. Um, there's almost 2,000 packages on CRAN alone, or if I combine CRAN and Bioconductor, no more than 2,000. So really, packages is where you um, where you want to go. There's two um, really simple ways to bootstrap a package. We took the existing function package skeleton from R itself and wrapped enough RCPP around it so that instead of a plain package, an RCPP package is generated. So that's one. And the other is, and I'm just going to show this live now, is again, you can rely on a, for technical reasons, uh, slightly different than calling RCPP um, uh, package skeleton function. It's, it's a re-implementation, so it's not exactly identical, but it's just, um, just as good. So um, instead of saying new file, C++ file, which we did for the one-off file, we're now saying new project. And you may have opened this and seen this before. It generally asks you, do you want to create a new directory or work with an existing directory or bootstrap by pulling something from a source repository? I often go to new directory. And then on this next screen, 
if you have the packages on your system, it gives you options about uh, creating a package with RCPP or with Amadio that we already saw, or with Eigen, an alternative to Amadio, as well as others. There's RCPP Parallel by, by Kevin, JJ, and, 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 and others, and, and so on. So here we're just going to say RCPP. And again, um, I'm just going to call this demo, and I'm putting it in the temp directory, uh, where I may have tried that first yesterday. Um, we see now that our studio pivots off immediately and we are in a new project demo package and we have a set of file for the package. So really how to do this was very straightforward, new project, new or existing directory, and then select RCPP and or RCPP Amadeo depending on what you want. The screenshot is a little older, so the, the, the graphics and colors are a little different as you can see. Also, I've also fallen for the fashion of using a dark theme just like uh, anybody else does. Um, um, all right, so the slide actually showed doing it with uh, Amadio. So let me um, do that again real quick because now we've seen it and do the same example. So then we have demo armor package. Also below temp, same thing will happen. It'll pivot around again. And now in the source directory, we will see I think the same function yep um, that I have here the, um, this is basically a variation on the theme of what I showed earlier in the slide in comes a column vector and if we're returning the column vector times its transpose it creates a matrix if we're doing it the other way around and the column vector comes in and we transpose it and then multiply it with itself. It's an inner product rather than an outer product, and that creates a single number, which <coughs> by Amadio convention, you have to be safe and invoke an explicit casting operation to take something that otherwise would be a vector or matrix um, uh, context and an Amadio type context to assign it to a plain old data type in C, C++ type, a, a scalar, a single double. So you do this convention. So here now we have for the same vector, you know, one, two, three, uh, or, or randomly drawn, an outer product and an inner product. And I think I then got clever exactly and also showed how to return list of objects by sticking them together. So there's, you know, there's all sorts of generalizations. We show them as simple examples in here as well. Um, because it's a package, I could now just say um, install and restart because package building is, is well understood within RStudio and, and works quite well. We sometimes do it within. I also often do it without, so I go back and forth. But now we basically have the um, um, and that, of course, is very embarrassing. So I'm being caught here by a bug, so I'll have to uh, look at that in a moment that may have to do with the fact that I'm using a dev version of RCPP rather than the one from the uh, um, rather than the one from Chrome. Let me just see if uh, this one builds or whether I'm running into the same um, issue. I did change something recently on the package builder so maybe I'm leaving a I have to look into that. So maybe maybe that's a change that I hadn't picked up from R4. Also, something seems to be different here with the exporting. So um, that will get taken care of. That usually works, but not right now. I'll um, I'll try to follow up on that. Sorry about that. Um, but that was basically the gist on, on packages, apart from the current, hopefully not very long lasting um, bug that we're seeing here. Um, creating a package around RCPP is pretty straightforward. Let me fill up one more time on my coffee. It gets me through the hour here. Um, but there is one complication if you want to go beyond a self-contained package. R code with RCPP and or RCPP Amadeo or RCPP Eigen is relatively straightforward, but often you do that because your lab, your advisor, your friend, you yourself with other work somewhere else on the web, maybe a C++ library that you want to bring to R by virtue of RCPP. And that's eminently doable and lots of people have done it. There's just one additional complication that we may now have to deal with that external library. And dealing with that, unfortunately, is not um, uh, an entirely solved um, problem. 
because um, while I said earlier that um, um, work for RCVP is really easy because we can rely on R and R gives us all this infrastructure to compile, load, link, that's just in the space of what R itself provides. If we want to bring an additional um, library to the R world, we actually have to make sure it also arrives on all the systems in a way that's usable by R. And that's just an order of magnitude more. In essence, and that's what I'm discussing here with this slide, um, you can differentiate three cases. You can take the external library you want to wrap as a full copy into the build of your package. Your package will then be a little heavier, will take a little longer to build, but it's, um, it's totally defensible um, because it's self-contained. And as long as the library that you want to bring in isn't hundreds of files, people may well be, well be willing to wait a minute or two for the build. The next step up is take a library that comes um, and expect it to be external on the system. Um, that works really, really well because you don't have to rebuild the library each time your package updates, but it will fail when the library is not on the system. That can lead to unhappy users. Um, one reasonably well-known example where I helped a little in actually bridging these two and providing both is NLopt. It's a really nice optimization library um, it's quite popular and used a lot with other languages too. Um, its main author became a key Julia contributor. We can use it from R as well. And there at package build time, it actually checks whether it is as a system or not as the system. If it's not as the system, it downloads and builds it locally. So you can do something like that too, but it makes the package immediately much more technical and you need to, need, you need to know more about uh, package building, library building, than just providing a package. So all of a sudden, uh, the, the load is heavy on you as a potential package author. And with C++, and something that we've used for great extent here with RCPP MIDU, there's the third option. If you have a library that's headers only, um, such as Amadeo, uh, in the way that we use it with RCPP Amadeo, because LabRack and Blast are given, um, the Amadeo author would actually shake his head if I asked him if this library was was header only, but we can use it header only in the R context. That was our our way out here and an early and very key insight Doug Bates had provided. And there are a few others like that, and uh, there are quite a few packages on CRAN that, that do just that. If it just brings in the headers, all it needs is um, availability of those headers at compilation time, and because you can provide those headers uh, for compilation time use, and there's no linking, it makes it a little easier. You will not get bitten um, as, as badly from the difference between Windows, Mac, Linux, as you do in the other cases. It's really still an open question and an open problem. So, because the question comes up uh, often enough, last fall I actually sat down when I was intrigued by yet another library that I came across uh, from a write-up on the web. Uh, the library is called Corels. So I um, spent a day or two writing a fragment package around it as a, as a sort of a feasibility test. Can, can we do this? And while I was doing that, I was writing down some notes and then I put the notes in a few pages of PDF and put it on archive. Um, and I think we're going to ship this uh, same uh, short paper as a vignette in the next version of RCPP. Um, so this goes over some of the technical points behind creating a, a package with an external library. And oddly enough, um, I was then a bit in contact with Upstream for Corels and we were working together and trying to fix a bug or two, but uh, we concluded the time would be right to put the package on CRAN and it arrived on CRAN this morning. So there's now a package Corels. I think when I wrote the paper, I still called the, uh, the package in it RCVP Corels and we now decided to call it Corels just like the Upstream project and the Upstream Python library, but it is, uh, it is there. So yeah, that's... Um, uh, that's that's a few words just on 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 packaging, um, but with that and you know having had RCPP uh, for 10, 12 years and having giving these talks and see people use it or not use it or some people starting use then not use it, I thought we could also revision uh, re re revisit the question of whether you should use it or not use it, and in contrast that that a little so. I don't really want to give people the, uh, the impression that this is the only way to go about creating a package. While um, just over 50% of packages with compiled code on CRAN is a really uh, 
nice vote of confidence. It also means there's an equal number of packages that get by um, perfectly fine without RCPP, so you don't really have to use it. My argument mostly is that with RCPP, I get some code generators and helpers um, that are good for creating a code that take errors and tedium out. Um, the interfaces remain short and simple, and as we saw on the isOt function uh, in the beginning of the of the webinar, the code is um, uh, of the same length, is short. Um, you're also not compelled to use C++. You can use RCPP to just write C code. The um, tooling and code generation that's provided wraps C++ around it. It is effectively a superset of C, so if you just want to use C, you can do that as well. Um, and or you can just stick, of course, with the plain C API of, uh, of R itself that, that R itself uses. R itself doesn't need C++ and gets by. And there are many, many packages from R core on down on, um, on CRAN that only use C. But, uh, and I have an example on the next slide, um, when you do that, it's generally a little bit more work. There are added manual steps there for converting types from R to the compiled language that you're using and additional step needed to actually do it proper and cleanly. Um, if you've had the opportunity to go to the last couple of, of USA and related conferences, our core member Thomas Calibera each year gave a talk sort of highlighting uh, bad patterns you could you could say about people using packages a, a wrong way and not protecting the arguments the right way. To me, that really is an argument for use of RCPP because it uh, takes that manual tedium away from you. So this is um, context from a slide that I'd used years and years and years ago. So I, I, I dug it back out and I checked yesterday, it's still there. This is source code from section 5101 of writing R extensions, the manual for this whole topic. And it shows this uh, source code. It, it cheats a little because it, it wraps, for example, these three statements on a single line, these two on one line, this loop in one, um, when it discusses dot .call. Uh, I completely went over that topic because extending R with compiled code, you can use dot .c, which is deprecated, or dot .call, which we all use now, but you know, writing R extensions needs to explain that a little. But basically what happens here is that as a running example, a convolution of two numeric vectors is computed. So in goes a vector and a second vector and out goes a vector. If we're doing this in the plain C API, we have this much um, static boiler code to do before we can actually get to the business by you know, transforming the incoming objects, uh, uh, extracting the lengths and all the rest of it. And the actual work that we want to do really is just this doubly nested for loop we need an additional loop just to um, prepare the output vector. Um, we have to do some memory business. There's three protects here, so we then have to unprotect the exact same three. So um, perfectly fine, zero dependencies, lightweight code, runs fine, but it's, it's just manual, and I'd rather not. I prefer reading code like this on the right, which is more concise, income two vectors, I use the vectors to extract the properties of the lengths directly, lengths of the first vector, lengths of the second vector, construct um, an expression of that to allocate a results vector of the required uh, lengths. Same thing happens here as well, NAD uh, defined and, and, and used on there. And then do the single uh, loop of the convolution transformation and return the vector, no fluff. But you know, again, people have a choice. You can use, you can use either. And you can even benefit from RCPP, even if you want to write code like that, if you just use it as a compiled tool. Um, ambitious title in the talk. Um, after after a um, couple of years of giving these talks and these intro tutorials, I want to just make it a bit more spiffy and talk a little bit about uh, machine learning, which we, which we generally do. I'm running a little bit of time out here today, but uh, by and large, I'm just using that as a pivot to come back to Amadeo and then in LPAC. Um, because several of us, of course, machine learning, you know, having been called KDD and, and other things uh, in the past has been around for a while. Uh, a friend of mine and I had once looked into Shark, but then someone else wrapped it and by now it had disappeared. So that's a machine learning library. MLPack is one that I like quite a bit and I'll talk about uh, it for in, a, in about a minute, for another minute. 
if you allow me to go a little bit of overtime and uh, DLib is quite impressive as well. So let's talk about MLPack um, for a bit. Um, it's by and large the work of Ryan Curtin and collaborators that Ryan started when he was a grad student at Georgia Tech. It actually sits on top of Amadio and uses Amadio as the matrix and vector structures, which when you already know Amadio feels just right for the expressiveness. So it's, it's good. Um, it's a super powerful project. It's super fast because it uses C++. Because it uses C++, it's also that small amount harder to use than say Python. And Ryan is a little sad now that he bet full force on C++ many years ago and didn't do bilingual right from the start and sees many uses today of uh, scikit-learn, which is really widely used as, as equivalent to something that MLPack really could have had because it's as good or better. It just doesn't provide the Python as much. So now Ryan and others focus a bit more on bindings and hopefully we will have uh, updated our bindings too. There were several um, um, initiatives in the past to get MLPack to grants. So Kian Ku, who's now also an RCVP core contributor, did that once as his Google Summer of Code project. It's still there, but it embeds the library and with that it's a fixed um, uh, and now outdated version of, uh, of, of MLPack. A few of us then tried to do version two, but we were running into this problem with an external library and getting that one to CRAN was tricky, even though we were learning on Simon for Mac OS and Jerome for, for Windows. So, but, so that was basically stalling, but you know, hope is there. Uh, we have a very exciting Google Summer of Code 2020 project uh, that is happening at this um, Git URL as well as within MLPack. Uh, I'm a co-mentor on it, and we're doing that actually in the framework of the MLPack project rather than the R project, taking advantage of updated wrappers there. So hopefully we'll have a bit more to, more to show. Just wanted to show you know that MLPack really is pretty stiffy. This is this is an old copy and paste text from the from the website listing all the algorithms that are in there and how easy it is to use that. Once you've learned a little bit about Amadio, um, so now instead of using depends as we are do, we're just using MLPack in this particular version, then in goes a matrix data and a number of clusters. And for example, a k-means decomposition then just assigns an output uh, vector assignments, instantiates a k-means object k and calls it member function with the incoming data, the number of desired clusters and puts the cluster assignments into the vector assignments. And we can return that back to R as a results list by simply invoking RCBP list create with the two objects. Um, that easy. And with that, you have k-means from C++. Um, this isn't rerun, this is copied and pasted from the old vignette for that. There you get pretty much a 33% uh, three, 33 fold speed gain over the uh, k-means implementation in R itself if you use the one that relies on um, MLPack. A uh, couple of other examples, running a linear regression is straightforward too. There is of course a linear regression in MLPack, but being an ML project, it actually doesn't stop at linear regression, it already does ridge, but if you set the ridge parameter to zero, uh, ridge um, um, contracts to being the same as, as OLS, so you get OLS out. Here I have a quick comparison with the trees data set of whether the fitted values from our LM in R and the linear regression via MLPack are the same, and of course they are. Um, logistic regression example, um, linear regression example with, um, oh, that's a wrong title, logistic as well, with some data set and a bit more with nearest neighbors, but uh, I don't really have the time for it because my uh, computer tells me it's 9.03, so I'm over the time budget. I don't wanna keep all of you that much longer. Uh, lots of vignettes in the package. I think I have to update that nine to 10 now as well if the one about corrals is in there. Um, couple of vignettes became papers. Um, we have a no nonsense, low volume, pretty helpful mailing list for questions. And of course I answer RCVP questions on Stack Overflow as well. And there's always some blogging. We have a really nice contributed website, yet another good JJ idea that we call the uh, RCVP gallery. It's from pre-Hugo days, so it uses Jekyll to take Markdown and then make it um, uh, make it articles. It's by now maybe 115 or so. Uh, as a search engine there, you can look for particular topics. The book that took the early versions of some of the vignettes and put them together and edited and expanded a little um, 
it is in the intro chapter a uh, really long discussion of Fibonacci from various aspects is out there so you can look at that as well and um, here are a couple of links to my presentations directory where these slides are already sitting my websites and other stuff and then the next uh, couple of pages that I won't get uh, into are basically more usage examples from uh, MLPAC, Amadio, BH, Wrapping Boost and, uh, and, and running examples and that's basically all that I had and because this is online and a webinar I can't really stop and take past questions so uh, um, all I can say really is um, thanks for watching thanks for interest in RCVP give it a try with the simple examples and uh, if stuck ask questions stack overflow the mailing list uh, issues and bug reports at github and then look into why the uh, package generator uh, failed there